Hello, everyone. Uh, this is the 4 o'clock meeting of EDAP 587 for the summer 2017 online class. This will be a fairly quick class tonight, um, mainly because what I have to show you is fairly self-explanatory. But I want to go over the argument, if you will, uh, the persuasive argument for how we're going to be doing things in this class so that you have a better understanding of how things work. Right now, I hope you've been able to get into the Collaborate. I sent you a quickie little um, email video about that. And I'm hoping that everyone has been able to um, join or view through the Collaborate. As I told you in the email, there will be a new link right here after tonight that will be called EDAP 587 Recordings. When you click on that, it will basically show you the recordings for each one of our uh, little classes uh, that you can then watch at your leisure, in your space, and on your own time. Right now, I just want to kind of go over uh, the rationale for what we're trying to do here, and then I'm going to show you what to do for tonight's class, give you a little taste of the ideas, but then I'm going to leave the role up to you to watch all of the material that you'll need to do Module 1. As you can see for Module 1, here's the video I sent you that basically previews the class. You will get that every Friday. Uh, this past Friday, we had a few problems. Well, hello, James. Welcome aboard. Can you hear me OK? You can either talk to me or type in down here in the chat room, either way. All right. Yeah, are you gonna? Are you in the 585 class, James? Yes. Uh, can you hear me talk, Mr. Swan? Oh yeah, hear you. I hear you fine. I'm on satellite internet out here in the country, and it doesn't always work. But yeah, I'm in the 585 and 587 classes. All right. Then I will see you here. Uh, I'm going to start that class at 5:30, just so I can do a reload back here and make sure everything works right. And I also gotcha. see that Andrew has popped in. Andrew, can you hear us okay? All right, excellent. Uh, another question for both of you gentlemen. I'm assuming you're seeing my screen right now. It says Module 1, Course Modules, and all of that. Yes, I can. All righty. Okay, what I was going to do is I don't need to spend a lot of time this evening in Module 1. Uh, mainly because it is self-paced. You can work through it at however fast and whenever you want to. Uh, this is not going to make or break a grade. Uh, this is pretty much a way for me to kind of get into your head what the history of this is. But actually, there's also some subterfuge going on here, mainly because I want you to experience what e-learning used to be like. Um, and what we have here is a series of resources for you to use
And this is what, uh, as I said, if you look at the first one up here, this is what it used to be like. This was considered very high-tech stuff back in the day. Um, you basically work your way through a series of objectives, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then on the other end of it, you take a quiz. And that's the way this is set up. As you can see, everything that's for the quiz has been identified as such. Is there a lot of stuff here? Not really. Um, you can work your way through it very, very quickly. And what I will do is when I'm finished this evening, I will turn on the quiz. You'll see it right here, right above the e-learning uh, fundamentals. This quiz, when you get finished with it, should generate a certificate. Uh, this is something you can do inside of Blackboard very easily. Let me turn off editing because it gives it a different look than what you should be seeing. There we go. Uh, the certificate is nothing more than a JPEG or a picture. Just copy it, paste it into the live text in the correct place, and you will have fulfilled the class requirement for module number one. Let me just real quickly, though, share with you the argument. And what I mean by argument is not that we're going to argue. We're going to discuss, I hope, the ideas behind what we're doing. So this first module is nothing more than where did distance ed come from? Uh, what are some of the pieces of it? The second module, this is where we get serious about what we think is behind good uh, e-learning. I should probably share with you that in Jefferson County Public Schools in my old job, one of the things I worked with was the JCPS online platform. Uh, Jana Hickey was our lead on that one, um, but I was also heavily involved in that. And that's kind of where I cut my chops in terms of using an LMS. Blackboard is an LMS. JCPS online is an LMS. Schoology is an LMS. LMSs are essentially um, entire ways that you can set up a class and everything in it is made up of pieces. Over here is a good example of pieces. Uh, CMSs, which stand for content management, the other one is learning management, by the way. They are basically receptacles of information. Now, a good example of a CMS is a Moodle, if you've ever heard that term. So if you go into a Moodle setup, you'll see lots and lots of folders, lots and lots of stuff. Some people would argue that the other LMS that we're playing with in this course, Schoology, is really just a CMS. Actually, it has changed to where it now can be called an LMS. And I'll show you why when we get into it. Because there are hooks uh, from other programs into uh, Schoology now. And you can also put things into Schoology that you create in other applications that your students can see or your students can work on. But behind all of this is something very, very profound. And it is the idea of what is a theory of online learning. How do you, why do we learn this way? And how is it different? This is chapter two. Uh, one of the little jokes I made to you in an in earlier video was, I could have had you buy this book. Uh, you all would be throwing things at me if I made you buy the whole book. Uh, it's written by a guy by the name of Terry, I actually know Terry Anderson. Um, and the thing about this book that I really like is he does a very nice job of laying out the issues around uh, online learning. But I've kind of broken them down this way. Right here we have three videos by a guy by the name of Joel Barker. And Joel basically created this paradigm shift movie back in the 19 late 80s, 
so it's kind of fun to see the clothing and everything. Uh, it still holds up, mainly because what he's saying is paradigm shifts are incredibly hard to do. And what most paradigm shifts are is just a remake of what we've already done, to slap a new name on it. And goodness gracious and education, are we really good at that? So this is basically the first idea, and that is a paradigm shift. I want you to watch this. This is one of my heroes, a guy by the name of Sir Ken Robinson. He talks about the paradigm shift that needs to take place in education. And then we move into an idea called constructivism. John Abbott did not invent constructivism, but he's probably one of the godfathers of constructivism. Uh, constructivism, as you will find out, is a way of we build knowledge about the world around us. I do not think of constructivism as a theory. I can see I see it as a reality. I think we're always constructing uh, new learnings. It's not something that is removed or only exists in a classroom. And then the third one is inquiry-based learning. And again, what I'm asking you to do here in these, and this will be, of course, next week. You don't have to do it now. Um, is then we're going to use a tool called VoiceThread. And we're going to start developing our ideas using a tool like VoiceThread. Uh, I'm a huge proponent of VoiceThread. It's one of my, I just think it's one of the best tools around out there. And we'll talk about that next week. And as you can see, by next week, we'll be already be looking at Schoology. But now here comes the meat of the class. This is called knowledge building principles. Before knowledge can be created in a e-learning situation, the four areas have to be present. First is constructivism, building new knowledge that a student receives from you and then being able to explain that new knowledge. This is also at the heart and soul of understanding by design, the Wiggins and the McTeague idea. The second is collaboration. No one of us is any smarter than all of us. That's a idea I hold near and dear to my heart. Uh, I have a PowerPoint in here that I will share with you where I show the close shot of Thomas Edison holding a light bulb, and then the next shot I show you is Thomas Edison standing there in his laboratory surrounded by his assistants. There's very, very little out there that is done that is done by just one single person. So collaboration must, must be part and parcel of an e-learning experience, mainly because you're not sitting there. You're not face-to-face -face with people. So we have to come up with a way for people to do that. This one is very important. The ideas to the center kind of comes out of constructivism. The ideas that the kids hit have about what you're teaching, constructivism, needs to be a part of what becomes the learning. There is so much that kids gather through their rethinking and trying to understand what it is that you're teaching that can be correct in the sense of it reflects what the learning should be, but they don't ever really understand it until their ideas move to the center and that understanding is then demonstrated, applied, if you will. Again, that's a UBD principle. And then finally, something I also very, very strong about is questioning. So questioning is here. Questioning is really here. And then questioning is here. There is, there is no hierarchy here. All of these take place in and out, in and out. Uh, knowledge building, which you can read, is 
the process of creating new cognitive artifacts. And a cognitive artifact is nothing more than, what do you know? Um, we basically are going to create our own e-textbook using the voice thread where you're going to explain to me your understanding of these 12 principles. Don't panic. They're very easy. Um, and then we're all going to drop in and look at each other's textbooks and then ask questions and share ideas. Again, following these four ideas up here. We then move into, away from the theoretical, into the actuality of creating something. And I am going to use for this class Quality Matters as the design framework. Quality Matters is a nationally recognized standard for developing of online material. We are going to be using the quality standards for K-12. There's a quality standards for higher ed. Uh, which wouldn't apply to us. But look and see what it says here, that it's a set of standards. It is a peer review process. This should not be evaluative. This should not be used as a way of evaluating your teaching. It's a course development tool, and it's a professional development opportunity, and it's an opportunity to participate in the community. Again, going back to one of those pillars, collaboration. This is a very straightforward, what and the reason why I love it is it is so simple to look at and apply. And there's, there's only a few standards. That's the other reason why I like it. And then we go into the real application. Right now, I'm going to assume that all of us, that none of us, are going to want to develop a Blackboard um, presence. If you do, you need to let me know. Schoology is usually what I find most people want to work within, uh, mainly because it's free. Don't be put off by people saying to you that Schoology costs money. Schoology does not cost money unless your school district decides to buy it to administrate it. Otherwise, you can create a Schoology course for nothing. And we'll go into some deep understandings about Schoology. Ignore all this stuff about live text and classes and all that. I'll clean that out tonight. And then your hallmark is essentially you're going to take that Schoology course or that Blackboard, if you're going to use Blackboard and JCPS, and we are going to then apply the quality standards by literally going into your class and saying this is where Standard 1 lives, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. You'll never use 9, so it's really just 8. That's a direct quote from the training. <laughs> I don't know why, <laughs> but there it is. So that is our class, sort of everything thrown at you at once. The argument is very simple. The structure matters, the structure being which LMS or CMS you use, but what really matters is how you structure it and what you put into it. If all you have is text and test, it will be a miserable failure. If all you have for its use is a way to assign homework and see if it gets done, you will have a nice way of running a hand in. Uh, I would strongly suggest you use something else for that. And Modo pops into mind. But what we're trying to do here is to actually get under the hood, find out what makes a online course meet those four pillars that we saw in the knowledge building principles. How do we allow for people to construct new knowledge from the knowledge that you give them? How do we allow them to do demonstrations of that, going to the UBD principles? How do we do collaboration? Are we just going to go in and just have stuff that I read and I don't ever talk about it? I never share with my uh, the other people in it? 
and ideas to the center. My ideas about what we're creating must be honored and must be allowed to be expressed in a safe uh, zone. One of the things that I've always found fascinating is uh, when I've worked with the University of Toronto with a program which unfortunately we can't use uh, because it's uh, going, well, it's frankly dying, which is a shame. But one of the things that we were always surprised by was how the quietest kid in the room had the best ideas. Because they're the ones that think about things all the time. Uh, we were always surprised about how clearly some kids who were labeled with learning deficiencies would have in cutting through the noise and seeing what the ideas were. And so in those situations, if this is present, this is present, then we really see some interesting things. And then, of course, the questioning goes without saying. We have to allow people to question their new understandings about what we have done. And what I feel very strongly about is once we understand how this thing works, then the rest of this just falls into place because it literally will walk you through, hold you by the hand, and say, you need this, you need this, you need this, you need this. What we then get to do is play with tools like VoiceThread that allows us to do some really interesting things. Um, a VoiceThread is a tool that allows you to create uh, collaborative workspaces where people can go in and work together in a group, creating a presentation that exists and can contain whatever you got, is what I always say. So if you wanted to create a presentation that had people being able to interact with your presentation, you can do that using something called a voice thread. And I've already created one in here, right here, that we will use for our module two. It's a very simple, very simple voice thread. Um, but voice threads can be full of information and full of interactivity. And the beauty of them is, and this is the part that I find so fascinating, is that I can take a voice thread and I can either copy it, in other words, right here where it says link, or export, and I can download it, I can copy the link, I can copy the, the code that allows me to have it live. There we go, right here. So the voice thread could live inside of Schoology and people could drop in and see it. It's a, a very powerful little program. Now, let's get to what we're doing today. For today, what I need you to do, and hang on here while I pop back out. This is the interesting thing about uh, Blackboard. Everything inside of Blackboard is a link out of Blackboard. <laughs> and to get back into Blackboard, you have to kind of jump around and follow your breadcrumbs, which is this up here located at the top. You'll notice right now that it says, I'm in my course modules. If I were to move somewhere within the course modules, you see, it shows up up here. So if I want to jump back, I just click on back here and this is where I belong. So I'm going to wrap up this very short introduction to Module 1 by allowing you now to have the chance to go in here and start looking at these things. Um, I'm going to jump through this very quickly just so I can make sure that we're all understanding. We know that Bloom's taxonomy has changed greatly. And we know that the roadmap for 21st century learning is pretty much passe. No one could figure out what it really was about. And I think one of the best uh, criticisms I've heard of it was from uh, 
Wiggins and McTee, Grant Wiggins basically said he made a pretty uh, graphic. And I would agree with that 100%. You know all about Mr. Gardner, or Dr. Gardner. I think one of the things that I really appreciate is the new mind as opposed to the old minds uh, where you were a literate thinker, where you a natural thinker, where you a musical thinker. I think this makes more sense. And as you can see then, what we have to be careful about with e-learning is we have to keep coming back to this idea that we're still nurturing people. If we just look at e-learning as something in a box, then nothing will happen. You'll find that the same stuff that you've always had will be the stuff you get. Uh, because we have to realize that there's a different pedagogy at work here. And if we don't embrace those pedagogical considerations, then what we'll do is we'll become very good at the technology, but we won't be very good at the pedagogy. In other words, trying to teach people using this. Connectivism is directly related to the knowledge building principles. Uh, George Siemens is from uh, Canada, and uh, he has a very large following there. Why is Canada so interested in e-learning? Well, it's the biggest country in the world. And I told you this story already in one of the videos I sent you about at one end of Ontario, the province where Toronto is located, is Toronto and Windsor and a host of other cities. At the northern edge of Ontario are polar bears. So within that understanding of how big a country it is, it's no surprise that e-learning has always been central to the educational process there. They were the first people to develop radio uh, education. They were the first people to do video education, what we like to refer to as KET. Um, it's a direct link between the two. We have to realize that we have to do things differently in a learning situation that is online because all we're doing then if we don't do it differently, going back here to Mr. Einstein, and you'll hear this from Joel in his videos too. Okay, I'm not going to keep running through this. I'm going to let you do that. I'm going to swing around here as soon as I'm finished. All of these are nothing more than these little uh, PowerPoints, but this one is where you have to literally work your way through these modules. They're very straightforward. And as I said, the reason why I'm asking you to do this is because I want you to experience the old thinking, the old way of designing an online class. And this, this was probably in its time, well, what am I saying? It's still used today. This is the way that a lot of online classes are used today. And are there things in here that are something that are good for us to um, look at? Well, right here, they're using a visual to emphasize the point of what they've got down here. And they've got some nice graphics. This is not bad, okay? This is not bad at all. What it doesn't have in here, as we keep working our way through this, is where's the interaction? Where is the ability for you and I to have a chance to share our ideas about anything? So, as I said, there's nothing difficult here. It's very straightforward, very easy to understand. Um, and you will have no problem with the quiz. All right, I'm going to stop because at 5.30 we have another class that's going to run a little bit longer than this one has. Are we having any questions? Does everyone understand what we're doing? We are doing Module 1. Do we need to have Module 1 done by next Monday, Steve? No.
no. As I've said in the video, if you will look at the length of time that the registrar has put for this class to run, it's literally going all summer long. I want the quiz completed when you get the quiz completed. Now, that sounds kind of trivial, but if you'll do this, what it does is it helps you if you're walking into this and you don't have any language, any knowledge of the language of online, you probably need to sit and do this pretty quickly because that will get you up to speed. If you already know what synchronous, asynchronous, and what um, design, learning design is all about, especially when it comes to uh, designing for online, yeah, then you need to do this. Is the quiz a make or break activity for the grade? Only if you don't do it, okay? What I'm trying to do here is to get you to experience what the old school of e-learning looked like. And then what I'm going to be doing for the rest of this class <coughs> is convincing you there's a better way. Okay? Did that answer the question? All right. And as I said, um, I can spin around here and look on the, uh, the back behind me, but I think the registrar has us from, what, May 8th through August 8th. So the question is, could I work ahead? Could I go ahead and start looking at stuff and getting it done? Sure. Of course, that's the whole point. If you're one of those people and you want to start just working your way through things, you go right ahead. I will have these recordings posted every uh, day after class so that if you want to come in and make sure that you're doing what you thought we were supposed to do for that class, you can see it. Okay? Alrighty. Um, what else? What else? What else? Oh, the recordings, they'll be right here underneath where it says collaborate for EDAP 587. It'll say EDAP 587 collaborate recordings. And that's where it is. I will, when I see you next Monday, uh, is everybody good with the Monday at 4 o'clock? Is there anybody with a real need to change the time? I just picked it arbitrarily because that's what the start date was, was on a Monday. Okay. When I see you next Monday, we will dive, we will look at this, we will look at the quiz, uh, and again, so you're saying that you'll be looking at the quiz next Monday so I could wait until next Monday to do the quiz while you're going over the quiz? Yep. Yep. You've got to realize there is a seismic change that will be this class. This class will be less about assessment and more about understanding. So I am not interested in you making a 50 or 100% on a quiz. That is not going to be the dividing line for me. What I'm more interested in is your demonstration of understandings. And also let me reiterate, for those of you who may or may not have gotten that first video, this is a open-ended process that we will be doing. You're going to be designing something, but you don't have to take it and use it in school, which would be stupid because you're out in the summertime. But if you want to come back and do an independent study, in fact, I just got through setting up two of these today. If you want to use this as the basis for an independent study where you take back what you're designing and actually implement it in your classroom with real kids, then we can sit and talk about you getting a three-hour credit course, uh, course credit, excuse me, for an independent study employing this design that you are making, okay? So there's an old saying. There is belief mode and there is design mode. Belief mode is module number one. 
module number two. Oh. <laughs> Don't you love it when your computer doesn't do things? There we go. Module number one, module number two. Module number two is heavy, heavy in the belief mode. It's, it's pretty much the core of what we're doing. And then module number three. These are all belief modes. In other words, we're loading up the brain with new ideas and new words. When we get to module number four, we are into total design mode. This is where we take our ideas that we now have gotten from these discussions and we're ready to go to town and to design something. Okay, I've talked enough. I have a bad habit of doing that. Uh, I'm going to depend upon you to cut me off if I'm rambling or talking too much. Uh, as I said, this video, this recording, will be available to you come Tuesday morning. Uh, is there, are there any questions right now for the good of the group or for me? If not, I'm going to declare us finished for the afternoon. <laughs> yes, yeah, well, you know. It's called professorial disease, you know, when you talk too much. Uh, I will try to keep it to, to the point and short. But as I said, when I see you next Monday, we will go over that quiz. So if you want to try your hand at it or if you want to wait to fill it out, hey, it's fine with me. And then we will go in-depth into the whole uh, ideas that are there. I would ask that you spend some time watching the videos. They're really, really good. Um, well, Abbott's a little, you know, Abbott's a little dry. But uh, the paradigm shift ones are excellent. They're very, very informative. And in fact, I would use the paradigm shift ones with kids um, in school. This is good stuff here. And then I'll give you a great big hint that if you will figure out how to get into, actually, I'll show you how to get into no offense. Uh, to get into the voice thread, within the voice thread is a video that does that. Talks about this chapter right here. Okay? All right. I'll see you next Monday. Oh, if you have a question for me, you can always reach me via text at 502-457-2937. Thank you, guys. Andrew and James, and I guess I'll see you in about a half an hour. Bye now.